Welcome, adventurers. Today on Rebel Then King, it is time to re-re-rank all of the classes in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Now that I have had a little bit of time to sit and think about the changes from Player Core 2. Some of you have asked why a ranking and not a tier list, and to that I say, well, there are already a lot of really good tier lists. I'm doing something a bit different here. I've already done rankings before, so I'm going to stick with that because I think it's interesting to see the changes in between the rankings. What is going to be in this list? Well, it is my personal ranking, and I'm going to talk about the changes since last ranking and the first ranking and how and why that is kind of going over the mechanics, what the class does or what it is supposed to do at least, and whether it can achieve that with the features and feats and structure of the class. I'm also going to talk about the structure and organization of the class as well. Basically, are the rules well constructed, easy to understand? Do they make sense? I think the how is just as important as the what. So we're gonna talk about that. And then I'm going to go over my likes and dislikes, and that is pretty strictly personal, but I think there's value there. I kind of see it as, you know, sometimes you might have a friend whose opinion in movies you trust, but you have different taste in movies. It's quite valuable, I think, to know this is a friend who likes horror sci-fi, and I don't really like that. So if they like a movie, well, I might not like it. And if they don't like a movie, I actually might like it. I'm going to try to talk about what I do and don't like about classes so that you might listen to my opinion and say, well, the mechanics sound good, the organization sounds good, and I actually like the flavor, even though Rebel Then King doesn't like the flavor, so therefore I like the class. I think that is about it, but do stick around for the end because I want to talk about some interesting trends that I noticed while filming and uh, working on the script here. Uh, and as always, I'm going to start in the middle with number 12, the Druid. No change since last time or since the first time because Druid is always going to be my definition of the baseline middle of the pack class in the best way possible. They are a spellcaster with the primal tradition. They have medium armor though and shield block. They've got cool feats, cool focus spells, uh, and they've got the animal or plant empathy. It's kind of a bit of everything that they do somewhat equally well. As far as the structure goes, how it's organized, it is a classic simple subclass system. You pick your subclasses and each is trained in a skill, gets a feat, gets a unique focus belt. It is all that it needs to be. What I like about this class, I love that it is a bit of everything. I love the simple design of the subclass system. And honestly, I would play in a system where everything used this kind of basic subclass with different features and feats and stuff like that. I think it is just, it's its kind of perfect. It's, it's plain, but perfect. Uh, what I dislike about the class, well, there's nothing too strongly dislike per se, but it doesn't have necessarily a wow factor because it is, again, kind of the base for everything. It's a little bit of everything, but not necessarily the best at anything. Number 13. Moving down to number 13, I now have the Rogue. This has moved down a little bit. It's never been a personal favorite of mine, but the mechanics are great. And it's only moved down because, frankly, this is going to be the trend in this video. A lot of other stuff moved up. The mechanics of this class, what does it do? How does it do it? I mean, skills, skills, skills. So much skill training, skill feats. It is the skill utility player of Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and it does a great job at that. It is also a class that is pretty decent and reliable in combat. If it is paired with other frontliners is, I think, the one caveat there, um, because it does often rely on flanking in order to get in those extra uh, sneak attack damage uh, bonuses, though it can achieve that on its own through some class features and feats and things like that. So it does work quite well in combat too. The structure of it, how it's organized, it's another good design. It's a very cool subclass system uh, that actually lets you change your key ability score. It's got the most flexibility, in fact, in key ability scores because it's not the only one that lets you change your key ability score, but it is the only one that has more than two options. So it is quite flexible there. Otherwise, it is your pretty standard. You get some uh, training and a skill and then some combat utility or other feat to go with your subclass. 
What I like about this class, there is no denying that all of those skills in one character is fantastic. I love that it also has a great teamwork, uh, you know, almost reliance, I would say, or it's strongly encouraged to lean into teamwork in combat in order to get into those flanking positions to be able to attack an off guard enemy. And then you do get some later teamwork feats that are kind of off guard for all, which is quite handy to have. So it's a great team player. What I dislike about it, it's not super reliable on its own as a frontliner. You kind of need the focus elsewhere and then the rogue to come in and provide some sneak attack damage. It might be a little bit too much of a generalist now, especially now that the swashbuckler and investigator have sort of upped their game uh, and they also have a bit of a roguish flair to them. So there could be a little bit of competition there. Number 11. And now on to number 11, where I now have the Monk, which has moved down quite a bit in my rankings, though that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think I actually had it, you know, kind of too high in some of my previous rankings. I think at one point I gave them a lot of credit for being great at roleplay. And I mean, sure, there's roleplay there, but it's not like a strong roleplaying class. So I'm disagreeing with some of my past videos. Sorry, old me. As far as the mechanics of this class, what does it do? Well, it's always been simple and reliable you kind of boiled down monks into flurry of blows, which is two attacks for one action. That's great. And then excellent unarmored defense and saves. That's sort of the core of the class, but you also get very cool stances and other feats that you can uh, use to make a very flexible fighting style for your monk. A lot of variety, even though there isn't actually a subclass system. So now onto the structure of the class. Yeah, no subclasses. I was kind of hoping for a stance related or fighting style sort of subclass in Player Core 2, and I think that the monk actually got the least amount of changes. So yeah, that didn't happen. What I like about this class, I really do like the defenses. Let's start there actually, because being a frontliner who doesn't take damage all of the time is kind of rare. And with those expert unarmored defense and the expert saves, well, you are avoiding being grabbed or being caught by a trap or something like that. And it's just nice to have someone up front who you don't need to rescue all of the time. Of course, the action economy boost from Flurry of Blows is fantastic, and it's just a good, effective, simple design overall. What I dislike about the Monk, again, nothing really to dislike per se. It's just maybe not quite as exciting as some of the other classes that are higher in the list. Number 14. On to number 14, where I now have the Witch. Now this is down since my last ranking, but it is way up overall. A lot higher than it used to be pre-Player Core 1. As far as the mechanics go, it is kind of a classic prepared spellcaster. It is prepared, but it can use any of the spellcasting traditions, any of the spell lists, depending on your subclass selection. It has very cool buffing and debuffing abilities in its hexes and hex cantrips, and it has super enhanced familiars that, as of Player Core 1, have an ability that is used or activated when you cast or sustain one of those hexes. As far as the structure goes, it is a classic prepared spellcaster, at least in the spellcasting parts of it, where you have a spell list, you have spell slots, you have your cantrips, and you pick what you want to use every day during your daily preparations. The subclass does grant you a unique familiar ability, which is huge. And again, that is new. And wow, did that fix the witch up a lot. Gave it a unique identity that it really needed. The subclass will also alter your tradition, as I mentioned earlier, and grant you some spells. It's kind of a boilerplate caster, but with this awesome new familiar ability and the cool hexes and hex cantrips. What I like about this class I love some of the hex cantrips, especially debuffs. I really like debuffs in this game, so it is very cool. I mean, I like buffs too. It's just, you know, there's another class that buffs pretty well. And while some of the new familiar abilities are super cool, and again, the witch needed this so much to finally have a super unique identity to it that wasn't just, you're a wizard, but you can choose something other than the arcane spell list. As far as what I dislike about this class, I still think some of the familiar abilities 
might be a bit hard to consistently use. So having that familiar as your selling point might not be the biggest selling point that it could be. Number 10. At number 10, moving quite a good deal up, I now have the Investigator. And this is due to the changes in Player Core 1, one change in particular. So first of all, let's talk through the mechanics with some of the changes. Pursue a lead is cleaned up a little bit and it is slightly better at kind of guiding you towards the resolution of your mysteries, at least rules as written, though it was always kind of open to interpretation and a lot of GM feedback anyway, but it's cool to have this very good, well, investigative ability in a class. Um, this has also led to, I think, devise a stratagem being able to be used as a free action more often in combat. So you have a better action economy while still being able to use your higher intelligence modifier and add extra damage to your strikes. And now there is finally something to do if devise a stratagem has a very low attack roll in the now alternate skill stratagem. This is the change that I wanted to see. This is quite good. I wouldn't say it's fully amazing, but man, it is a big improvement for this class. As far as the structure of the class goes, how it's laid out, um, you know, the pursue a lead, devise a stratagem, all the text to it, it's a lot. There's a lot there, but I think it's quite readable and it's, you know, you can get through it and it's not like you'll have that many questions after you're done. You just have to make it through a few paragraphs. Other than that, the subclass selection is pretty simple. You're trained in a skill and you kind of gain a feat related to that skill. That's about it. So it's a lot of core class mechanics, that, but then I think that each subclass, even though they are quite different, isn't that much to take in. And that's kind of a cool thing to have, I think, like the main big structure and then small but significant other changes. What I like about this class, I love that there is an exploration and mystery oriented class. It's not just all combat all of the time, because frankly, a lot of the other classes pretty much exclusively focus on combat and leave you to fill in the gaps. This does the opposite. It is the gap filler, I guess I would say. It's the caulk that keeps the uh, party well sealed from noxious vapors. Maybe. I don't know. Anyway, uh, what I dislike about this class, um, okay, the skill stratagem, I like that there is something to do when the device stratagem attack roll is bad, but it does only apply to a limited number of skill checks. I would like to see some more options here, especially if it was an option tied to your subclass. I think that would be really cool. Number 15. And now at number 15, moving down and down, I'm sorry, is the wizard. Mechanics, what does this class do? Well, it casts magic, and it is very good at that. It technically can cast the most spells from spell slots in a day. For more on that, go check out my Sorcerer versus Wizard video. They can also do some other things or change the way that they use magic uh, by modifying their spells or slightly modifying their spell preparation, uh, having a special kind of staff or a familiar. It's seriously just all about magic. As far as the structure of this class, it's got kind of a cool primary subclass and I would say secondary subclass or maybe like sub option uh, setup where you have your arcane school, which is uh, what will grant you some spells and give you a unique focus spell. And then you have your arcane thesis, which does some of those modifications to your casting that I alluded to. What I like about this class, look, I like this class a lot. I really do. I love that it is all about magic and it does it well. I like the flavor. I like that it is a studious character that wasn't just born with it, but actually learned things. I like the arcane school and thesis kind of build. What I dislike about it, relying so much on prepared casting, I'll admit, is tough. Uh, and I actually moved the witch ahead of the wizard due to, I think it was actually a, a video that Nonat did where he mentioned that, you know, the witch has these cool uh, debuffing hexes, buffing hexes as well, that cost one action. So you use your two action spell or two action cantrip, and then you always have a good third action there. And the wizard doesn't really have that. Some of the focus uh, 
spells are sustained, so you will use that third slot to sustain the focus spell or, you know, sustain another spell. So there is that, but the witch just has it a little bit easier built in. They're both prepared casters. So I am actually moving the witch slightly ahead of the wizard for those reasons. Number nine. And now at number nine, I am happy to say the alchemist is moving way up. Let's talk about the mechanic changes in player core two and why this class has moved up so much. Remember the old alchemist suffered quite a lot in its inventory management. At lower levels, you would run out of your reagents and you couldn't make any more alchemical items as an alchemist. And then at higher levels, you would have a lot, but it might be too much and you literally couldn't carry it. And it was still kind of tough to know how much to prepare in the morning versus how much to keep for quick alchemy throughout the day. And now we have split advanced alchemy and quick alchemy into two different things. So you make your items in the morning and you get to carry those around. And then you have a new versatile vial system, which you can use for quick alchemy throughout the day because it is a replenishable resource. These versatile vials can also be used as items themselves, either as a simple bomb by any alchemist subclass or as something specific to each of the subclasses, which has helped out the other subclasses quite a lot. As far as the structure of the new alchemist, this is what is keeping this from being a top five class. Uh, to me, I really like the new mechanics. I do. I just don't like the way that they're fully organized and I have a whole video on that. So I'll skip that and you can go watch that video. Uh, as far as what I like about this class, I would say it is pretty much my favorite flavor role-playing style of class in the entire system. It is why I chose Alchemist as my first character, and it is why the new Alchemist was the first thing I read when I opened up Player Core 2. As far as what I dislike about it, again, the structure in that other video. Number 16. At number 16, I now have the Ranger, which is just sort of sifting down a little bit. It is still a fantastic class. The mechanics of the Ranger, what does it do? Well, it is designed for hunting down and taking out single enemies. Uh, you do so by hunting prey, and this does give you some great exploration bonuses to seek out and track down that prey. And then it has absolutely fantastic combat bonuses against one enemy at a time. This can lead to a bit of an action tax if there are multiple enemies and you keep having to hunt prey, make a strike, and then hunt prey, make a strike over and over. As far as the structure of this class goes, it's a pretty simple design with shared hunt prey exploration bonuses, but the combat bonuses are unique to each uh, Hunter's Edge subclass option. It is either strength or dexterity base, which I think is very cool, and it does open you up for being a you know, ranged hunter or an up close uh, kind of combatant. So really no complaints in the structure. What I like about this class, I love seeing a little bit of exploration bonus in addition to the combat bonuses. Some of the combat bonuses are absolutely fantastic. Nobody has ever said anything bad about a flurry ranger. And if you did, you are wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, they even have some spells that they can cast. And you know, I like a little gish, a little magic mixed in with my marshal. What I dislike about it, again, the action problem, the action tax, a bit of hunt prey. It might also be a little bit limited in campaign settings where it just doesn't feel like it fits in. Uh, but, you know, that's really nothing too bad. It's just that everything else in the system is now so great. Number eight. At number eight, I now have the swashbuckler, which again has moved way up. Player core two is really coming out ahead here. The mechanics. Finally, we have mechanics that back up the roleplay fantasy of this class. Your agile and finesse strikes do more damage all of the time due to the new wording of precise strike. You now have a bonus to your bravado actions in an encounter, not just after you gain panache. You now gain a short-term panache even if you fail at a bravado check and you gain panache even if a creature is otherwise immune to the thing that you're doing to gain panache, and then you still get to use your big old finishers after that. It is fantastic now. As far as the structure goes, it's got a very good, very simple subclass system. Each subclass gets a skill and then a special bravado action related to that skill. 
it might be the shortest subclass uh, section in the game, and that is perfectly fine by me. What I like about this class, I love the daring playstyle. The mechanics that back it up now are clutch. I like having a frontliner that does a lot of damage, but it's kind of about creativity and showmanship and not just, you know, standing in the pocket and swinging away. What I dislike about this class, I mean, not much other than you are limited in your weapon choices, so you will never be the hardest hitter, but that's a pretty minor complaint. Number 17. At number 17, I now have the Oracle, which is creeping up in my rankings. The mechanics of the Oracle, well, it is a lot simpler now, I'll tell you that much. Uh, you are cursed as an Oracle. You advance your curse or activate it initially by using a curse bound action, and you can move through curse bound one all the way up to curse bound four at later levels of the game. You have some great focus spells as an Oracle. It is one of the selling points of this class, if you ask me. You are a spontaneous caster with tons of spell slots and with six cantrip slots, which is more than other sp uh, spontaneous casters have access to. It has a lot of magic, but it gets punished for using some of its unique abilities. That's the trade-off of the Oracle. The structure, again, it is a lot simpler now than it used to be. The subclasses are also simpler. It's not just the curses. Uh, there is no more mystery benefit, which used to be something that came along with each subclass selection. That was just permanence. Uh, that is gone now. Uh, but the subclass selection does grant you some spells and a curse bound ability, curse specifics, uh, and focus spell. What I like about this class, I love the damage plus debuff focus spells. It is my favorite way to focus spell in the game. I like being a spontaneous caster with the maximum amount of spell slots. That is a premium option for spell casting. And I think that having the new curse bound abilities that tie directly to the curse is pretty cool. What I dislike about this class, I gotta put it out there that even though the old abundance of flavor text wasn't something that was a selling point to me personally, it was liked by a lot of people who really liked the Oracle, and that is quite a bit reduced now. So I think people who loved the old Oracle aren't going to like the new one quite as much. You also only have one focus spell at level one rather than two before, which was something I did like. So it did get better and simpler overall, but it maybe lost some of the zaniness that was the selling points before. That's why it's moved up, but not quite like jumped way up in the rankings like some of the other player core two classes have done. Number seven. Now onto number seven, where I have the sorcerer. This continues to move up in my rankings. What does a sorcerer do? Well, they do magic, they do it well, and they do it easily because they are a spontaneous spellcaster. They don't have to put in all that prep work that the wizard does. They also have this now part of the core class core class feature, Sorcerer's Potency, that allows them to add damage to spells from spell slots or to add extra healing if you are healing with spells from spell slots. And their Blood Magic did get a boost in Player Core 2. Blood Magic is a temporary effect that happens to you or a target after you cast a spell associated with your bloodline. As far as the structure of this class goes, well, the subclasses will grant you training in a skill, they give you a focus spell and multiple focus spells later. They give you your blood magic uh, abilities and grant you spells. It's pretty simple, but there's a huge variety. And then even within some of the subclasses like the elemental and the draconic, there's a huge variety uh, within there depending on which element or which draconic exemplar you choose. What I like about this class, it is simple and it is effective. It is the perfect sweet spot on the chart of effectiveness to simplicity. It's no question it is the best spellcaster for beginners, but it's not too simple to keep an advanced player interested. Dislikes, I mean, despite some of the upgrades, some of the blood magic is still maybe a bit underwhelming, so I think that could use even more improvement. Number 18. At number 18, I have the fighter, which is no change from my last video. The mechanics of the fighter. Fighters fight. They have expert weapon proficiency, training in all armors, and they have shield block, and they have a reactive strike. They are in arguably great in a scrap. As far as the structure goes, uh, no subclasses, just feats. It 
doesn't really get any easier than that. What I like about this class, I mean, it is an undeniably fantastic martial option. The best, really. I'm always happy to have one in my party for that reason. What I dislike about it, it's just not super exciting to me. I like subclass design, which this lacks. I like spellcasting gish, which this lacks. It's fantastic. I mean, mechanically, there is nothing wrong with this class. It is absolutely amazing. And like I said, I am very happy to have one in my party. It's just not what I want to play. Number six. At number six, no change from my last ranking is the cleric, the mechanics of the cleric. It's a healer and it heals well. Remember that pre-player core one, you had your charisma modifier actually dictate how many heal spells you have or harm spells, I should say. Uh, well, that's no longer the case. Remember, you just get a full complement uh, every day and it does level up as you level up. Um, the fact that you are wisdom base also means that you are great at non-magical healing. So you are just healing left and right in and out of combat. And then you can either be a full caster with your uh, cloistered cleric option or lean into Gish with the war priest option. So you have other utilities other than just healing, though you are going to be so good at that, you're going to spend a lot of time healing as a cleric. As far as the structure goes, as I mentioned, there are only two subclasses, basically full caster or gish, adding some armor and weapon abilities with the war priest. I feel like the chasm between these two different subclass options is about the widest gap between subclasses of any class in the system. So there are only two but it still feels like more in a way because they are so different, if that makes any sense. And I like that. Other things that I like about this class, I love having a dedicated role and delivering on it. And it is a very important dedicated role in the system. This is the class that saves parties, let's be honest. Uh, it can do more than that though, because you can buff with some good divine spells. You can do some damage. And as a war priest, you can get up front and tank a little bit too. What I dislike about this class, well, to be honest, it is the class that I feel like you always want in your party. You always want them there saving you, but it's not necessarily the class that everyone wants to play. Number 19. At number 19, moving down is the Magus. The mechanics of the Magus. It is the true Gish class. It is martial and magic. Limited magic though. Uh, it has this spell strike ability where you infuse a spell into a strike, and when that lands, it is devastating. Uh, it has conflict spells, which are spells that recharge your spell strike. I like that. And it also has this arcane cascade ability where after casting a spell, you drop into a stance, and the latent energy of that spell is imbued into your strikes. When done right, this class hits hard. As far as the structure of it goes, I love the pairing of Spell Strike, Conflux Spells, Arcane Cascade. It's a very cool synergistic design that all of them work in conjunction with each other and aren't just exclusive options. The subclass is cool. You get a Conflux Spell, which is unique to each subclass. And I always forget about this somehow, a unique ability that you use only when in the Arcane Cascade stance. I always forget about that. What I like about this class, Spell Strike Devastation. Seriously, it hits so hard when it hits. I love the uh, synergies between the different abilities, like I said, and I like that it is a mostly martial Gish character. We have a lot of casters that can also do some martial abilities, but this is the other way around. It is actually martial first. It is strength-based. Your combat abilities come first, and then you add a good dose of magic on top of that. I like that a lot. As far as what I dislike about it, it can be very action hungry and very difficult to line up all of the things that you want to do round after round. When you miss, you miss, but I still, I still love this class. Number five. On to number five, I now have the Barbarian due to some of the changes in player core two. The mechanics. It does one thing and it does it really well. It hits stuff hard. And to be honest, this might be the most important role in Pathfinder 2nd Edition because sure, you need healing, but if something is still hurting you round after round, you will run out of healing resources and you need exploration and diplomacy. 
but you gotta be alive to do that. So you gotta take out that big baddie standing in front of you. As far as the structure of this class, Rage. It is the core class mechanic. It is easy to understand. You get mad, you hit things. It has been improved in Player Core 2. You now will, for the most part, be able to rage on initiative and not have to use an action to do so. You don't lose armor class anymore while raging, which is huge. And there are some lessened restrictions uh, dictating when you can rage again. The subclasses are quite simple. Uh, you gain an instinct ability, though there is some slight variations in damage types and uh, you know more complexity in some of the subclasses than others. What I like about this class, I love having a pretty much singular focus class that does it so well. All of that extra damage from Rage on your strikes is huge. This is how you take down things, even if they have a resistance, even if they have a huge a well of hit points, the Barbarian is going to bash its way through. What I dislike about this class, I mean, the first level feats and the Fury Ranger are still maybe a bit meh. Number 20. At number 20, I have the Psychic, which is moving down due to everything else moving up and getting cooler, but also due to realizing the limitations of Unleash Psyche a little bit more. The mechanics of the Psychic. It is a unique all day caster. What I mean by that is it does not rely on spells from spell slots, though it does have a limited number of them. Instead, it relies on cantrips. Now it gets extra special cantrips right out of the gate, but it can also modify or amp its cantrips using focus points. And it has two of those. Uh, so fewer spells from spell slots, no focus spells, but extra good cantrips. Very unique in the system. The structure of this, well, again, I said it's got focus points, two of them, but they're used to modify and not cast spells. Cool. It has a dual subclass system in the conscious and subconscious mind, and that does allow you to switch between intelligence and charisma as your key ability score. What I like about this class, I like the creative use of focus points. It is a cool new way to use a core mechanic in the system in a different way. There are a lot of combinations of Psychic with the dual subclass system, and I like that there is a caster that, you know, gets to add damage to cantrips when they unleash their Psyche, which I kind of skipped over. That's a heightened state that the Psychic enters after casting spells. It has a limited duration, but does allow you to use unique abilities and to add damage to your spells. But on that note, the dislikes unleash Psyche doesn't feel like it has the impact that it should have. It does have a limited duration. It can't be used in the first round of an encounter, and it does leave you debuffed, stupefied afterwards. So I don't know. It feels like it doesn't have the punch to it that you would expect from a class that is called the Psychic. You would hope that Unleashed Psyche would like really do something, and it's always a little bit underwhelming. Number four. At number four, no change from last time, I have the champion. The mechanics of the champion. This is a class that is built all around reactions. They are reactions that are triggered by enemy attacks that either blunt damage or counterattack or debuff the attacker. It is super survivable with great armor and shield block, and it's designed to hold the center of the formation, stay alive, and protect its allies. It's a very cool role. It's kind of the only one, at least for now, playing that true tank role in the system. The structure of it, a lot of very good improvements in player court too, like the champion's aura, which is a consistent way of affecting the battlefield around you, a lot easier than the old range increments that were on like every ability. It is just now champion's aura. It's also got a new, more exciting and flexible subclass system. You are no longer tied to good and evil, which affected both your reaction and your focus spell, but now you get to mix and match a little bit. And there is a new focus spell uh, called Shields of the Spirit, which I like a lot that you can choose for any of the champion builds. What I like about this class, reactions that you are going to use a lot. It is basically a constant action economy boost. I like that it is very gishy. You have focus spells right at level one, but more if you want them later. And it is a tank, all armors, shield block. I like the protection role. I like the reactive play style. It is a very important, very fun class. Dislikes, 
I don't dislike this necessarily, but there aren't a lot of bonuses to damage that a champion has access to, so if you like hitting very hard, this might not be the class for you. Number 21. At number 21, I now have the Inventor, and this is moving down, and to be honest, it is a class I kind of forget about at times. The mechanics of it, well, you invent something, either a weapon, or armor, or a construct companion. Uh, these are either like upgraded versions of core things or just something uh, new in the system. Uh, you also go into overdrive as a mechanic, uh, which is an action to check if you can activate your inventions in a way that adds extra damage, either adding half or all of your intelligence modifier to your strikes. That's cool. And you can explode. Uh, I mean, there's no denying that that is a fun ability to have, though again, it's one I forget exists at times. The structure of it, well, the three classes, the three subclasses are uh, what I just mentioned. It is based on your invention type. Uh, your innovation is what they call it, the weapon, armor, or construct. Uh, there are lots of variations within those choices. Uh, lots of unique stuff. Uh, and then you also have unstable actions, which are uh, explode is one of them. These are kind of like focus spells in a way that you can use them every 10 minutes but you can also perform a flat check to see if you can use them again. So you might be able to do something like explode round after round, which is fun. I like having that little bit of flat check for a little bit of fun when you use a big ability of thinking there's a small chance, but there is a chance that I get to do it again right away. What I like about this, well, what I just mentioned about the unstable actions I like, I like overdrive a lot. I mean, when you critically succeed, that is a lot of damage to add to your strikes. Also, explosions, how can you not like explosions, right? Uh, what I dislike about it, I'm not super excited by the armor or weapon innovations, and I think that having to make a check and succeed at a check to add extra damage has aged kind of poorly compared to the upgrades to like the Swashbuckler's Precise Strike, the Investigator's Devise a Stratagem, and the Barbarian Rage on Initiative upgrades. It just kind of seems like this inventor is now in need of an upgrade itself. Number three. Into the top three with the Thaumaturge. Now, this is only moving down to number three from its old position of number two because I like the new number two so much. The mechanics of the Thaumaturge. Well, you get a lot of core damage bonuses from your implement, which is a pseudo magical item that you hold in one hand while using a weapon in the other. You have implements empowerment that just adds static damage just from holding it. And then you've got exploit vulnerability, which is an action to figure something out about the creature that you are fighting. Uh, you can activate or change your damage strikes, I guess, to trigger a weakness. Uh, you can make up a personal antithesis if it doesn't have a weakness. And then it has kind of a funny critical failure effect where you are actually clumsy because you are fumbling around trying to figure out what to do. Uh, there are tons of fun abilities that each of the implements have. The implements are your subclass, so let's talk about that. Uh, it's a cool subclass system where you start with a single implement, but you add other implements as you level up, and each implement has a unique ability associated with it. And I feel like a lot of these abilities are kind of themed after some of the core classes, or at least other classes in the system. There's a little bit of like champion-like damage mitigation in the amulet, and there's sort of a fighter-like reactive strike in the weapon. What I like about this class, it is charming and mysterious. It's a charismatic marshal. It is charisma based. It can offer support. It can do so much damage that bypasses resistances. Just that is huge. It's not only a lot of damage like the barbarian does, but it is damage that just skirts right through everything. What I dislike about it, nothing really other than maybe it could do more magic, but then again, it does have scroll and talisman feats. So I don't know. It's pretty perfect. Number 22. At number 22, I have the summoner and there's no change here. The mechanics of the summoner, it is all about having you, the main summoner, and your Eidolon companion, but not companion in the sense of animal companion. Eidolons are their own set of rules in the system. You share hit points and a multiple attack penalty. You share actions and can share senses. You can evolve and boost your Eidolon. And you can be in two places at once on the battlefield because you are two independent creatures. 
It ends up being a Gish build based on the fact that the summoner itself is magical and the Eidolons are kind of more designed to be upfront uh, melee creatures. The structure, lots of unique mechanics as you might imagine. Eidolon is not a familiar nor a companion. It is his own set of rules. None of it is all that tough, though I do see people get things wrong. Example, I've seen people talk about how great it is to be able to attack twice without multiple attack penalty, but the rules do actually say you and your Eidolon share hit points and multiple attack penalties. So it, it does get lost in its complexity a little bit at times. What I like about this class, I mean, with the way that Act Together works, it is four actions every turn. That's pretty nice. And again, you are magic and martial, which is also pretty nice. As far as what I dislike about it, I think it works very well. It is mechanically sound. I am just not as inclined to playing that companion type of character. I would rather have my main character that I focus on. And I think that splitting the attention, you know, it just doesn't work out quite as much for me. I think it is totally fine though. If you like it, do your thing. Number two. And my new number two, because I'm playing as one and loving it, is the Kineticist. This class can do so much. Each of the elements that you can choose has a slightly different area of focus. There's like brutal targeted damage or area of effect damage, battlefield control, healing. And remember with the impulses that basically cast a spell or literally do cast a spell, but it's a spell-like activity, um, you can actually kind of cast more spells than spellcasters in a way. I mean, seriously, I'm playing as a wood kineticist right now, and I'm using Timber Sentinel, which is Protector Tree, and Wooden Palisades, which is a wall of wooden magical things, more than I would have as a caster, so often so that I would have no spell slots left. So that's fun. Uh, as far as the structure goes, it's completely unique, but easy to understand, though there is kind of a lot to it. I love the perfect design of Elemental Blast that is one or two actions, ranged or melee, and has different uh, modifiers to the damage based on those. And there's four total ways that it works out because the two by two options. And there's a very cool design of being able to choose either one element and getting a little bit more bonus to that element or choose two elements right at the start and get more variety out of what you can do by having access to two elements. What I like about this, I can't say enough about Elemental Blast. It is so versatile. Having the same attack modifier from melee or range is very difficult to do in the system, and you don't feel like you're ever compromising by doing ranged or melee or one or two actions. Having that one action ranged chip shot that you can take after doing a two action impulse feels amazing, and then standing close to something and doing a two action melee and laying in the damage feels equally good. Again, the impulses that basically let you cast spells more than spellcasters, well, that feels pretty good. Uh, I mean, I basically rebuilt my protection plus battlefield control wizard as a wood kineticist, and it is working out a lot better than that wizard did. Sorry, wizard. What I dislike, I mean, to be fair, there is a lot to this class. It is not something for beginners. I don't think it's confusingly worded or that tough to understand in the end, but it is a lot. Number 23. And now number 23, last place, no change since last time, I have the Gunslinger. The mechanics of this class. Uh, they are the only other expert, the other one being the fighter, uh, when it comes to weapons, though only with firearms and crossbows. They do add some extra damage to those strikes due to singular expertise, and they have specialty reloads that basically give them an extra action in each round and add a lot of flavor to each of the subclasses. It is a class that is undeniably fantastic at ranged damage. The structure, it's a well laid out class, it really is. I mean, it's not that tough to wrap your head around expert proficiency and a plus one on your strikes or plus one on your damage, I meant to say, because you were so good at using this weapon. The subclasses are easy too. It's a skill, plus a specialty reload, plus a deed, which is a specialty action, typically that you would take on initiative. What I like about this class, a ranged damage specialist is very rare in this system, so it is quite nice having one. 
the specialty reloads, which you can pick up more as feats, uh, do keep this class from being too boring overall. What I dislike about it, again, it's mostly just personally not for me. I am not as inclined to steampunk in this particular setting, even though I do like the alchemist. I see that as a little bit more magic-like, even though I know magic and alchemy are not the same thing in this, but I don't know. It's just not personally what I want to see when I'm playing, though I have a gunslinger in my campaign and it is a great character and it helps us out a lot. So even though it's at the bottom of my list, I'm still perfectly content with the gunslinger. Number one. And now onto my number one, no change since last time, the bard. In fact, it was my number one the first time. It's been my number one all three times. What does this class do? Well, what doesn't it do? It is fully martial as of player core one with access to all martial weapons. Plus it has light armor training. It's fully magical as well with spontaneous spell casting of the occult tradition. And it is the go-to support class with its composition cantrips and counter performance focus spell. The structure, classic, simple design, completely standard spell casting, spontaneous spell casting, the martial abilities I told you about, and each of the subclasses get a unique feat, which is a focus spell for some of them. Plus a subclass gets a granted spell. What I like about this class, I mean, everything. I love Gish. I love charisma based face characters. I love support. You level up your entire party's combat abilities as a bard. This has it all. You contribute in so many ways. What I dislike about this class, again, why doesn't Courageous Anthem damage scale? And maybe could the Warrior Muse get some medium armor? All right, we made it through the list adventures. Let's talk about some of the trends. Trend number one, everything is good now. Seriously, everything. There are no major mechanical problems with any of the classes. There are a lot of niche roles, a lot of variety, just lots of good stuff. Uh, also, trend number two, clearly remastered content is doing very, very well. Look at how many of the old classes, which have not been remastered at all, have moved to the bottom, the Inventor, the Summoner, the Gunslinger, the Magus. And look at how many of those Player Core 2 classes have risen quite a bit up. I mean, we're talking about the Swashbuckler, the Investigator, the Sorcerer, and the Alchemist. Trend number three, I like what I'm currently playing. When I was playing as a wizard, it was my number two. Now that I'm playing as a bard and a kineticist, those are my number one and two. And I see this as a good sign for the system. It means that all options are fun and rewarding. You might not even think this is going to be one of my favorite classes, but you start playing it and you dig in and you absolutely love it. That is a very positive thing. And seriously, just to recap, you really can't go wrong now. I wouldn't mind playing any of these classes and I would be downright excited and giddy to play like 19 or 20 of them. Uh, yes, there are some classes with maybe some minor mechanical problems and there will always be differences in the flavor and the role that you want to play. But man, if a class is calling your name, go for it. You will be rewarded. Well, what do you think adventurers? Are there any other trends that you noticed in my video or another's video or in your own thoughts about how things are shaping up as part of the remaster project? Let's talk about it in the comments. Until then, remember that I change my personal rankings more often than I change my socks, so I guess just be glad that Rebel Then King is not broadcast in smell-o-vision.